I think my impression of the summit is shared by a lot of American analysts that the document itself was actually quite weak. Uh, the bullets were short. They were, uh, they didn't have clear timelines and objectives attached to them. And the one on denuclearization in particular was interesting because it had three things in it that were a cause for some concern. The first was the reference to the Penmanjian Declaration. And while in general, I think the United States supports the efforts on North-South relations, the fact that this was largely a peace and aspirational document was a source of some concern. Uh, the second thing about the denuclearization bullet was the promise to work towards denuclearization rather than the promise to denuclearize, which is a little bit weak. And finally, there's the whole question of what the North Koreans and the Americans mean by denuclearization. And that's got a lot of attention in the United States, this idea that the North Koreans are talking about denuclearization of the whole peninsula. What does that mean? Uh, the U.S. has been talking about complete, verifiable, and irreversible dismantlement, not just denuclearization, but dismantlement of facilities. Uh, I actually don't think this is mu as much of a problem as some others do because clearly there are going to have to be trades about security assurances. So I see the denuclearization of the entire peninsula as part of the North Korean effort to secure assurances from the United States on the security front. Clearly, the summit was never going to achieve denuclearization. The only question was what the nature of the statement would be. And the idea was uh, clearly that the statement would not begin but continue a set of negotiations that had been undertaken by Secretary Pompeo and also by a team led by Sung Kim that was meeting in Panmunjom right up to the time of the summit. So what we're really waiting for at this juncture is some indication of what those negotiations yielded. Uh, this is one of the reasons I'm holding my fire on the joint statement and the summit itself, because I think there's still a lot we don't know about the post-summit negotiation process moving forward. The biggest surprise coming out of the summit was not that it took place or the nature of the summit document, but came in the president's press conference, which went on for almost an hour after the summit. And here is where the largest concern in the United States among North Korea watchers was, the use of the language of provocative, the use of the term war games, and of course a return to the president's preoccupation with the costs rather than the benefits of the alliances. On the other hand, this is something that President Moon, I think, was very much open to. Um, but the big takeaway from the exercise issue is the way that the Chinese proposal essentially is put back on the table. Um, the nature of the Chinese proposal, which is sometimes known as the freeze for freeze uh, proposal, was essentially for the North Koreans to pause testing of nuclear uh, weapons and missiles, which they've done since November effectively with the Olympic truce, but also that the United States would suspend exercises. And as recently as January, Secretary Tillerson, before his departure, had vociferously denied that the United States was interested in this trade, but it now appears that that's one of the major outcomes of the summit. The process by which we got to the summit actually begins with Kim Jong-un's New Year's speech, which was a quite interesting speech. It had three parts to it. One was that the nuclear and missile program had been completed. The idea that the capacity that the regime wanted had effectively been achieved. The second part, uh, interestingly, was about sanctions and the fact that the North Korean public should be alert to the fact that sanctions were coming and that the costs would be manifest. And the third, of course, was this kind of blackmail with respect to the Winter Olympics in which Kim Jong-un basically said, we can't guarantee the integrity or safety of the Olympics, but we can if we come. And that was really the start of this whole process. It was in some ways extremely contingent. And then President Moon was in a position to pick up on this. And then you had the North-South Summit and the whole succession of summits involving Kim Jong-un and the Chinese. And then ultimately, 
in the decision by the president, an impetuous decision to uh, accept the summit uh, for June, uh, for, for June that actually took place. Um, I think this means something very important though, because the president believes that the summit was largely a result of his doing, that is President Trump, when in fact uh, a complex set of interests involving the Chinese and the South Koreans were also in play. And what this means is that the conception of the post-summit period is actually quite different between Beijing, Seoul, and Washington. And one of the central fears that American analysts have going forward is that if the sanctions regime weakens significantly, uh, because that was, to me, one of the main things that drove Kim Jong-un to the summit, then the possibility that these negotiations will drag out increases. One of the signals that suggests that the North Koreans are actually interested in a fundamental strategic shift in course, which is a term that's, that uh, Secretary Pompeo used in the run-up to the summit, was the uh, Central Committee plenum that met in early, uh, at the end of April, uh, and in which, uh, which uh, Kim Jong-un said that uh, he was undertaking a strategic shift away from the Byungjin line and towards a greater emphasis on economic development. That uh, statement coming out of the plenum was complicated and contradictory because on the one hand he seemed to say that we have this capability, uh, suggesting that they might be interested in keeping it, but at the same time saying that the Byungjin line was no longer necessary, suggesting a more definitive shift towards economic opening and reform. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about what economic reform in North Korea might look like, for example, whether it would follow a Chinese model, but there's some fundamental differences between North Korea and China that make that course of action less likely and less possible in the end. The start of the Chinese reforms was actually in the countryside. Um, and at the time that the reforms were launched, about 80% of the Chinese population lived in rural areas. And so the transformation of agriculture and incentives to allow uh, basically a more household-oriented agricultural uh, system really provided dramatic benefits to large shares of the population and set in train a, a set of developments which ultimately spread to the cities and the, and the external sector. In the North Korean case, there's not really comparative advantage in agriculture and there's not much of a bump that the North Korean economy can get from agricultural reforms alone. Given the fact that the, uh, North Korea is basically a small open economy, what's going to have to happen is that the country is going to have to open significantly to trade and investment. And here's where the question of sanctions relief becomes complicated. Obviously, sanctions relief is a partial prerequisite for that opening to occur. You're going to have to get uh, countries willing to trade with North Korea and beyond China. But at the same time, it's complicated because the fall in trade with the rest of the world is not just simply a function of sanctions. It's also a function of two additional factors, the political risk associated with the nuclear program, but also the fact that historically North Korea hasn't been very good at protecting the property rights of those that invest in trade with the country. And we know that from surveys of firms, uh, Chinese and, and South Korean firms that operate there, we know it from the fact that investment was low even when Kim Jong-un was trying to open up these export processing zones. I think it's quite possible that uh, given the eagerness of the South Koreans and the Chinese to reopen trade relations that uh, this type of external opening could happen fairly quickly but it will very much depend on the engagement of the United States and whether the Trump administration goes back to secondary sanctions as a tool of pressing those negotiations forward. Uh, even with respect to the Chinese connection, Trump can disrupt that if he decides to go after particularly larger Chinese firms that are engaged in trade with North Korea. So as President Trump always says, we'll have to see what happens. Let's talk for a minute about what a settlement would look like 
And I think there are basically three models that are on the table for how this subsequent process might unfold. The first is that some combination of events, uh, including sanctions relief or the fact that the North Koreans never had any intention to give up their weapons, basically pushes us back into some kind of containment mode. And the idea of containment, and this has been suggested by a number of analysts in the United States, would be that we essentially give up on the prospect that North Korea would ever denuclearize or denuclearize completely and maintain uh, and go back to maintaining the deterrent as the main way of dealing with the North Korean problem. The second possibility, and I think the one that most think is likely, if not, or possible, if not likely, would be that you would get into an extended negotiation with the North Koreans in which the process is really more important than the outcome. And what I mean by that is that complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization would be treated as a long-term goal that would be put in train through an incremental process of steps in which uh, exchanges of, of quid pro quos would be made along the way, quite incremental, partial sanctions relief, partial assurances, but really with not a, a significant focus on an end goal. Uh, the process overtakes the end point. I think, however, what the United States is likely to do in these subsequent negotiations is to try to push the pace. And Secretary Pompeo has talked about a compressed schedule. He subsequently made references to a two and a half year timetable, that is by the end of the first Trump administration. And here the process would look a little different. It would include significant timelines with uh, deliverables at perhaps not one single process or endpoint, as with the Iranian negotiation, but perhaps in a set of staged or phased uh, concessions, but with significant steps in this process being achieved along the way. So for example, this could mean um, not just a freeze on, on nuclear weapons, but beginning with the process of shutting down Young Beyond facilities and subjecting them to verification as a first step, for example. Um, it could mean uh, capping or even identifying and destroying intercontinental ballistic missiles, allowing missiles of shorter ranges to remain in place. And then with subsequent steps in that process, moving on to other pieces of the nuclear program. Uh, for example, there are clearly stockpiles of fissile material, there are stockpiles of weapons themselves, there's the military industrial complex which would have to be repurposed. All of these could, uh, could be parts of subsequent phases that would be taken seriatim, uh, but in a process that would ultimately end up with complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. Uh, I still think that that's the United States goal and even if the first two options remain on the table, it's likely to be what the United States negotiators insist on.